If people can make their way back to their seats, we're going to resume the second part of our event. If you could make your way to your seat, we're going to resume the second part of our event. And I would like to invite the three panelists for our next panel up to the stage and to sit here. <laughs> okay, we're going to resume the second half of our event, and um, if people can make their way to their seats quickly, we would greatly appreciate it. Good afternoon. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch today, beautiful banh mi that we had. Um, I'd like to say that we're very excited to continue our event with an Afro-Asian dialogue in which we'll continue to bring this discussion home by exploring what these histories of struggle in Asia and Afro-America mean for Philadelphians and especially for young people today. In his final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Martin Luther King Jr. challenged the American people to recognize their own responsibility in determining whether humanity would follow the path of peaceful coexistence or violent co-annihilation. He did this by putting forward the concept of the world house, which many, many other people have brought up today, a vision for America and humanity where people of different races, faiths, and cultures find a way to live together in peace. Now, when this idea is taken seriously, it raises profound political and moral questions. For as we look out on the world today, we realize we face an international climate where the threats of war are louder than ever before. And domestically, American society is bitterly divided against itself. And right here in Philadelphia, poverty, gentrification, and unceasing violence rip apart the fabric of this city. And so in this panel, we will continue the conversation on the black freedom movement and Asia's anti-colonial struggles, putting forward these traditions as the basis for unity between blacks and Asians in this city. We do so in a time of great tension among many communities in Philadelphia, particularly between the black community and the Asian and immigrant communities. Everyone knows that these tensions exist and it's common to talk about them in public discourse. But, but what's left unsaid is the central question. Whose interests are served by these tensions? There is another side to the equation of King's World House, and that is the state of our youth, whose upbringing and future is our shared responsibility. And it's no accident that whereas young people once grew up with strong community institutions as their anchor, and freedom fighters, as Doc mentioned, Freedom fighters like Muhammad Ali, Paul Robeson, James Baldwin, or Martin Luther King as their role models. Today, they're given manufactured celebrities, social media, and a popular culture that cultivates nihilism and self-hatred. So in our event, we hope to make clear that the black freedom struggle and the world anti-colonial movements are the birthright of every child and the basis for the kind of unity that King envisioned. The purpose of cutting the younger generation off from this history is to prevent them from receiving a moral education, the kind that could provide them with the values needed to become the next generation of freedom fighters who can fight for a better city. This is why we have brought together this group of teachers and leaders who have been rooted in questions of young people in Philadelphia, 
in order to address the issues that they've seen with gun violence, despair among youth, and racial tension in the city. Furthermore, in this panel, we will explore the central question of education. What is the role of education in raising a generation of youth across racial and cultural boundaries to see one another as brothers and sisters? How can we use education as an instrument to build unity for a better Philadelphia? Our featured speakers today bring a depth of experience to address these questions. Through the lives that they've lived, they provide an example to the younger generation of what it looks like to be transformed by a moral commitment to struggling for justice, peace, and a higher truth. Pastor Tehu Lee is the founder of Uber Street Summer Camp and a pastor in North Philadelphia. Originally from South Korea, he has become a force for peace in North Philly over the past few decades. Catherine Blunt is a retired principal of Parkway Center City High School and a high school teacher with the School District of Philadelphia. She is a community activist organizing around racial, social, and economic disparities, as well as promoting peace with justice. And Brother Gregory Muhammad is a representative of the Student Nation of Islam Prison Reform Ministry, of which he is the Delaware Valley Region Coordinator. And my name is Jeremiah, and I'll be the moderator for this panel. And just to briefly go over the structure, each panelist will speak for approximately 15 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A and open discussion for about 30 minutes with questions from myself and the audience. And with that, I'd like to invite to the stage first Pastor Tehu Lee, followed by Catherine Blunt and Brother Gregory Muhammad. Good afternoon, uh, very excited to be here, and uh, so good to see diverse faces, and ages too, right? It's not just a problem with youth, but also senior citizens and everyone <coughs> around this country. So uh, my name is Taehu uh, Lee, and I was born and raised in South Korea. Uh, at the age of 29, I came to Philadelphia to attend a seminary outside of Philadelphia. And since 2003, I've been uh, living in North Philly. So just to give you an idea what I'm talking about, uh, give you credentials. Uh, this is a map of my neighborhood <coughs> generated by Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, I think 2007 or 8. And be between 2004 and 2007, four consecutive years, Philadelphia has been ranked as number one city in the United States among the big cities with the highest murder rate. Around that time, they generated this map, and I used to rent a home, uh, apartment, actually room, right there. And then currently, I live on 2100 block of North Uber Street, which is So uh, I could testify that I've seen a lot of violence. Even uh, last week, 2.30 p.m., I was kind of uh, cleaning the window of my truck, and just, there was a gunshot like 20 feet away, a guy running and shooting. So this is something <clears throat> I am keenly aware of, and especially since 2003 up till this point, I've attended too many funerals. Not necessarily of senior citizens, but young lives that were lost to uh, senseless violence. Can you go to the next one? So actually, Jeremiah sent me a bunch of questions and then uh, about this panel and uh, what took my attention was kind of uh, the issue of violence, which I think we are all aware of. Not only in the city, but right now in Ukraine, uh, the war is going on, and uh, this uh, madman, Putin's uh, ego and his, I don't know what you, what you call it, uh, yeah, his egomaniac uh, desire lust uh, is really wracking havoc uh, all around the world. 
When we talk about violence in the city, usually we talk about, we think about like, uh, you know, quote unquote, black on black violence. Am I right? But I, I, I want to kind of uh, take our attention to a bigger discourse about violence, right? This is violence. Not just a kid or a young man with a gun shooting somebody, but this is the violence that we need to be talking about. Next one. Uh, 30 years ago, actually this is a 30th anniversary of Rodney King. Uh, <clears throat> this was televised. It's an extreme form of violence because the police officers were supposed to protect and safeguard the well-being of citizenship. Instead, they terrorized a citizen. And this was televised. Uh, in the United States, violence is what? Sanctioned by the nation. Uh, our government allowed this kind of violence to go on, on the streets. Next. Not only that, uh, probably many of you are too young to remember this movie, Apocalypse Now. But again, like this crazy lunatic colonel, you know, in Vietnam War. Of course, it's fictional, but it's more real than reality. We even glorify violence. We should, talk, we should be thinking that violence is government sanctioned and even glorified in the media, movies, and news outlet. Next. And uh, in video games, like even younger kids play on screen on their cell phones uh, these games of killing somebody else or the other who may not look like me, who may speak different language, who may not invoke the name of deity the way I do and it is totally okay. So not only normalization of violence, but also there is the issue of, I may say, deification of violence. Because we invoke violence in the name of God or gods. So according to a dictionary, <coughs> I majored philosophy, so sometimes I tend to be a little bit pedantic, but uh, it's defined like this, the use of physical force so as to injure, abuse, damage, or destroy, which is pretty straightforward, right? That, that's violence. But when we, again, talk about violence, it's always somebody, individual, physically harming the other individual, whether it's a knife or in the United States, mostly gun, in the other parts of the world, it could be a bat or stone, club, whatever. And when he witnessed that kind of violence, we condemn. We even try to bring justice upon the person who is the violent one. And we have laws to lock him or her up. But let me talk about the other kind of violence that we don't really think to be violent, that we don't really see that's destroying our society, our fellow human beings. A few days ago, there was a Zoom meeting between the secular family members and the parents who lost their loved ones by opioid epidemics. And one of the family members declined to show his face, and some of the parents who lost their children by overdose accused them to be murderer. The Sacklers knew that OxyContin was highly addictive, but decided to hide the fact 
and gave kickbacks to doctors and whoever's in the industry. And as a result, tens of thousands of people are dead. And in the streets of Kensington, which became a national, actually international phenomenon, and you see a YouTube video, a new one every day, like zombies on Kensington, right? We don't think this is violence. What's the definition of violence? So as to injure, abuse, damage, or destroy. And we have court that tries to protect them. What about the financial meltdown of 2007 and 8? They knew those derivative derivatives were full of problems, but they kept on, had a mortgage problem. And again, tens of thousands of people lost their homes lost their health insurance, they died. Was anyone indicted? No. When President Obama came in power, he uh, funneled money. And what happened in Manhattan? In a foreign car dealership, Porsches and Maseratis were all gone. Because these Wall Street execs and employees who got bonus had to spend their money buying these things while millions of people were forced to be on the street. Millions of people died, went to jail. Is it violence? Yeah, it is. But we don't think this is a form of violence that should be punished. Instead, our government at least rewarded them. What about redlining? Is it violence? Yes, it is. Uh, in January, if you live in Philadelphia, and even for that matter, New York Times also had a big article about that. In Fairmount area, uh, there was a fire in Rohom. 12 people died. And among those who were dead, eight were children. On that Upstairs apartment, eight people were living together, and downstairs apartment, there were eight people, which originally was meant to be a single house, single family house. Why? Because of redlining, because of housing problems. This is violence that drove these people into inferno and made them lose their life. What about punitive criminal law system? Once condemned, forever condemned. And a lot of Americans believe that we are Christian nation. I don't think so, but if so, what about the spirit of forgiveness, right? The core message of Christianity is forgiveness. And when a lot of politicians believe or claim that our nation is Christian when it comes to criminals, it's punitive system. Once condemned, you become second citizen, second class citizen. You become kind of slave and you never remove that scarlet letter that's tattooed in your soul. That, I think, is violence we need to be talking about. So let's talk about uh, what's more familiar with us. The face of mass violence. 1995, a guy walked in Oklahoma City Hall, detonated a bomb, killed more than 200 people, his name is Timothy McVeigh. He's a white dude. Most recent memory, 2021, January 6th, there was a capital insurrection. And most of you have seen the footage. 
It was mostly white. Two thousand fifteen, there was a shootout between rival biker gangs in Waco, Texas. Not a surprise, right? Nine people were dead, and twenty were injured. Do you know what happened? In two thousand nineteen, the court dismissed all charges. No one was indicted when nine people were dead and twenty were injured. The face of mass violence. If the face is white, it's not violence. If it's not, it's violence. Then we be dealt with. We should bring law and order. We should crush them down because they are making our society unsafe. But if it's white, it's not even a crime. I don't know whether you saw the picture, but when the biker gangs had a shootout, when police came, they were joking with a police officer. No one was handcuffed. No one was hit with a staff. No one was put on the ground. No boot of police officer was on the head of those white boys. They were smiling, smoking cigarette, chatting, and all charges were dropped. We need to wake up <clears throat> to the reality. Let's go to the next one. Click. So, I'm more interested in kind of a getting your kind of a mind kind of rolling, right? So, we should get to the root of the problem. I'm not going to talk about the violence on the street because that has root to this. The problem we have is that when you think about power, we think power is a force to do violence. That's how we American in general think about power. Let's go to the next one. Click. So power is power to control, manipulate, retaliate, destroy, and kill. And if this is how we define power, the street violence will not stop. Because your government is using violence on other countries. Because your government is using violence to control certain group of people. But we need to uh, change the discourse. Next one. As a uh, Christian minister, the Bible, I believe, tells that the power is a force to bring shalom. I used Hebrew word shalom intentionally because the English word peace doesn't quite cut it. Right? That's the power of Jesus. It's the power to make flower bloom through the eyes. You know, Satan can kill and destroy because Satan can never ever heal or bring life. That's why the Bible, I believe, tells that power is power to a uh, force to bring shalom. Click next one. So it liberate, it prosper, it forgives, it restores, and it gives life. Imagine young people growing up understanding power in these terms. Not power to, you know, punch somebody in the face, not power to destroy, to kill, but power to do all of this, power to bring shalom then that, that's going to change a lot of things in our own life. Next one. All right. Uh, Jeremiah asked us uh, the, the role of education. And uh, I believe in education, but also I want to uh, debunk 
the myth of education. Why am I saying that? Uh, remember any of Hollywood movie where white person goes into inner city neighborhood, does something, where does it end? A troubled kid goes to college and the movie ends there. You don't see what happens afterward, right? Yeah, I believe the power of education, but, but it puts the burden on a shoulder of an individual. Like, you can do it, and if you stay focused, if you go to college, you'll make it. Why? Because that message ignores or even denies much bigger problems such as housing, access to various services, income inequalities, and whole nine yards of problems that we are reluctant to discuss. Yes, education can do some things. Let's see. Uh, it can empower. Next. It can teach history. So we will understand that actually, you know, Africa had an amazing civilization. Not like some coolest people understand. Next. And it teaches about diversity. So these are important. But, you know, do our public school system, like, are equipped to do this? Or are they training our young people to become good employee who's going to contend with minimum wage and think it's okay that CEOs get at least 300 times more than average employee and they make you think that's fair because they work harder. So we really need to change the way we conduct our discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Lee. And now I'd like to invite to the microphone uh, Catherine Blunt. Yes, I'm going to. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I told Tony this morning, I'm the prodigal daughter. <laughs> and I said to Jeremiah, give me some time, remind me, call time, so I can just get to the, the end, because I can talk a lot. So when I returned to the Saturday Free School and to my mentor and friend, Dr. Montero, this time, with my hope for the future almost depleted, and met these wonderful, caring young people from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds, I fell in love again with the beauty and potentiality of humanity. There were three concepts being discussed at that time of my return to the collective that I will, that will forever resonate with me personally and spiritually. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Senior Garment of Destiny, which was also espoused by Jane Baldwin James Baldwin, when he spoke about US white people and white society in his letter to his nephew, you know and I know we cannot be free if they are not free. Dr. King's beloved country, a loving and shared community, I'm sorry, Dr. King's beloved community, a loving and sharing community of people supporting each other, or as Baldwin describes the process in that same letter, that we with love shall force our white brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it, for this is your home. Do not be driven from it. Great men have done great things here and will again, 
and we can make America what America must become. And that passage reminds me of a Langston Hughes poem, and I love poetry. Let America be America again, as if it ever was, okay? And so he says, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free. We, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, the endless plains, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. And finally, Dr. King's World House, a world in which we recognize and act upon the basic human fact that our destinies are inextricably linked as we are all one within humanity. And it is our destiny, our destined future, that we seek a world of peace and unity among, and, among unity against the potential of nuclear holocaust. Seek a world of peace and unity against the potential of a nuclear holocaust. And that we strive for the betterment of the human experience for all peoples as we also strive to protect the environment and planet on which we live. It is then with this deep faith in humanity that I speak with you today about the gun violence in our city, about the despairing youth, about racial tensions, and about education as a potential tool to break down barriers and create unity among the African American and Asian American youth. It is time to suggest a way to build a better world and a better future through them. It is time for them to acknowledge that single garment of destiny that shapes beloved communities and leads to a world house of people loving each other, loving truth, and loving humanity. Baldwin, in his 1963 talk to teachers, describes the living circumstances and fate of the black child. A black child, at the world, a black child looking at the world around him, though he cannot know quite what to make of it, is aware that there is a reason why his mother works so hard why his father is always on edge. He is aware that there is some terrible weight on his parents' shoulders which menaces him. And it isn't long, in fact, it begins when he is in school before he discovers the shape of his oppression. And in Philadelphia, the statistics of that oppression is captured in the latest census data. Philadelphia, though they don't like to say it, is a minority majority city. Let me say that again. All right, Philadelphia is largely a minority majority city, or it is a majority minority city of 1.6 million people. With 55% ranging from the age of ranging from the age of 20 to 59, 33% millennials. Now that's deep because where are our millennials and what are they about? And that's serious consideration that we need to kind of look at, all right? 40%, excuse me, 53% are female, 40% are black, 34% white, 15% Hispanic, 8% Asian, and two multicultural, which uh, is another classification that they put together to diminish the classification of black folk. By 2019, Philadelphia became known as the poorest of the 10 largest cities with poverty rate of almost 26%, totaling 400,000 people who reported earning wages below the federal poverty line of $13,000 annually in the state with an hourly minimum wage of only $7.25. Philadelphia is also a population with large stress, with a large hypertension or stress rate. And in all these categories, Philadelphia ranks top among the 10 largest cities. The staggering or shocking 2017 data was more specific about this poverty by race. The black population at that time, 660,000, had a 30% poverty rate. That's almost 200,000 people. This is all staggering. The Asian population of 107. Uh, thousand had a 20 cent po poverty rate of 29,000 people. The Latinx uh, population have, of uh, 2018 had a poverty rate of 40 percent. 
and that's almost 87,000 people. While the white population of 527,000 had a poverty rate of 15%, which is almost 58%. In this poverty rate, 24% are males and 27% are females. When we speak about poverty, it must be clear that we are also speaking about the conditions of living, working, and of uh, living, working, and education, and health care, these individuals and families with their children especially must endure. endure. We know there is a wait list of over 400,000, excuse me, of over 40,000 individuals and families looking for housing they can afford. And I'm not speaking about the housing developers and city council legislation uh, man, mislabeled as affordable, because in the jargon they use, we don't understand what they're talking about. And that's intentional, because they don't want us to understand. We know unemployment and underemployment rates are high among this population. Their health care is sporadic, their diet is inadequate, with, me, with many barely surviving and with, flu, with, and with few prospects for their lives to improve from year to year. No government safety net, no sustained efforts by these boutique pop-up nonprofits nor blended funded techno innovative <laughs> entities to <laughs> to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to which city, state, and federal government responsibilities for citizens have been outsourced. And into this life, a black child is born and raised, as James Baldwin said to his nephew. This innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that, for the heart of the matter is here and the crux of my dispute with my country. You were born, you were born where you were and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be settled. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity in as many ways as possible that you were worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Wherever you have turned, James, in your short time on earth, and he was only 15, you have been told where you could go and what you could do and how you could do it and where you could live and whom you could marry, all right? And he went on to say, when you were born, we trembled, and we still continue to tremble, but without love of each other, we would not have survived. And some of our black youth are not surviving. They see no future for themselves in a country built by their unacknowledged ancestors, yet have no place for them. They sink in despair and without hope, they engage in violent criminal behavior aimed at each other, not at the society Baldwin hoped, with non-combatants, even children, caught in the crossfire. So one Wednesday afternoon in January 2022, a 17-year-old senior was shot at school, uh, at, at school, not really at school, but at the corner or across the street from the school uh, upon dismissal. He was a Bartram High student. He was the 39th victim of gun violence. And that statistic is on par with the homicide rates of 2021. With a total of last year being over 559 homicides, including youth homicides committed by youth offenders. It seems we are on track to meet that or exceed that last year's number. I need to add, these numbers have been increasing significantly since 2017 without attention or alarm until the gun violence epidemic and deaths were unmistakably, unmistakably and glaringly evident in 2021. As of March 8, 2022, there have been 96 homicides in Philadelphia. So what about the Asian child and the Latinx child being raised in this poverty? Because they are all part of this. We share, we share this together. What about their families? They too are impacted and neglected, maybe not at the same rate or to the same degree as the black family and black child. Sometimes these communities coexist in the same neighborhoods or exist in largely black neighborhoods uh, which have been a source of tension between and among them. 
when the Jewish-owned delicatessens turned into the stop and goes in the 80s, where the drug boys hung out and the malt liquor we called liquid crack was the featured sale. Or the bodegas, uh, the Latinx mom and pop stores springing up on the corners in black neighborhoods, which were suspiciously viewed by the neighbors as fronts for some drug cartels. People and families were isolated, eking out a living, if possible, trying to survive, not communicating, no real interaction, and generally not getting along. Aside from what is seen on TV, this is how these communities know and interact with each other without a foundation for understanding each other or each other's cultures. Mm -hmm. Education, which should offer hope and learning and opportunity, is also impacted by this crippling, po this crippling poverty and uh, what I call evidence of intentional societal abandonment. Nursery schools have a poverty rate of 31%. Elementary schools, 36%. Middle schools, 36%. High schools, 35%. Undergraduate schools, 35%. Graduate schools, 30%. I mean, this stuff is bad. So, all right. Okay, so, all right. So, um, and most of this poverty affects youth from the ages, well, affects young people from the ages of infancy to 17. Okay, so what we need, and I'm gonna talk about what we need. We need schools that will raise the issues for young people, that will expose young people to the realities in which they live. Uh, but that's not possible, uh, and we can't build these trusting relationships if we don't have schools with principals who are courageous and even subversive. And I was one such principal and loved it. You know, principals who take risks to center their pedagogy in their schools around the authentic and inclusive language, excuse me, learning experience, that intentionally explore our youth or expose our youth to the history of struggles for liberation and people seeking freedom in the United States and internationally, that intentionally adopt a multicultural curriculum to expose our youth to the rich literature and teaching of Douglas Du Bois King Baldwin, the rich music of Robeson, the poetry of love and struggle from the Harlem Renaissance and the black revolutionary poets of the 60s and 70s, as well as those teachings, readings, and poetry from other cultures that intentionally promise cultural exchanges or promote culturally cultural exchanges within the schools and even partnering with other schools to accomplish the task of building rich relationships among students of various races, ethnicities, and nationalities and cultures. That intentionally explore humanity's potential for good and greatness, peace and love, as opposed to the subjugation and exploitation of neocolonialism and the declassification of, sub of sovereignty occurring under imperialist, overt, and covert designs. So I have a proposal. I think that uh, we have two schools in Philadelphia. I'm gonna identify them, Southern and Furness. These are schools that have a uh, significant population of both Asian, uh, Black, and um, Latinx students. These are schools that I propose that we look at to begin actually exposing our youth, or those youth, to the single garment of destiny. Getting them to understand what that means. Uh, getting them to know uh, the beloved communities. In fact, turning those schools into the beloved communities that they can be to nurture uh, this, this, what I would call, growing uh, connection between cultures and loving each other and finally create that world house. Because that world house is not gonna come about through happenstance. It is an intentional, it is a design that we must, that we must then teach the children. And where the children go, their families will come. All right, that's it. Thank you, Catherine. And finally, I'd like to invite to the microphone Brother Gregory Muhammad. I 
know everybody tired, been here all day. Oh, excuse my mask. <laughs> and um, I thank the brother and the sister, Reverend uh, Lee and sister Catherine, uh, for their very powerful uh, direction that they shared with us. And I thank the Asian Art Initiative for allowing this space for this dis discussion. And I thank all of the organizers who uh, put their love and passion into bringing this together. I'm a different kind of speaker. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I am a brother that was a victim of violence on both sides of the street. And before I go there, let me do this, please. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, who came in the person of Master Fard Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And in the name of his Messiah, the exhorted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his exhorted Christ and Messiah, and I further bear witness that their true servant, divine reminder, divine warner, the modern Messiah and Jesus of today, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet you all in the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language. I salam alaikum. Now, uh, I thank Brother Jeremiah uh, for making sure I have these questions, because I'm a different kind of speaker. I came out of the belly of the beast. I served 34 years in prison in the state of Pennsylvania. Now let me talk about that for a minute, because we are talking about violence, right? And this is a strong message to our youth about violence. My father was a Philadelphia police officer. So I knew about the law and all of these things. I knew what my actions and my behavior, bad actions and behavior, could cause for me. OK? I went out in the street. I went to school. I did all the things I was supposed to do right. but. Because of some of my friends that weren't as right as I was, and they didn't want to hang out with me. Wow, you can't, you no, know, you can't do this with us. You're Papa Cop. You, no, uh-uh, no, you can't. So the peer, the peer pressure that I thought, right, um, said to me, well, maybe I need to do something to be accepted. I don't know if y'all experienced that or not, but I'm going to be raw here this afternoon. So I went out and did things that they were doing and did it even worse than they were doing it so that they can accept me in the game. Yeah, that was insanity. And I want to tell you what I mean by insanity. Excuse me. After I became a victim of the streets and landed in prison, I sat in my cell waiting to go to court. I'm not going to talk about what I did but I'm gonna give you some overview of what that would look like. 
It wasn't a crime against uh, law-abiding citizens, by the way. All of the players in this crime were criminals, too. They call it organized crime. So I had graduated from street gang to organized crime. But in this particular instance, I wasn't fully pledged to do what we did. My mind started changing on the streets. But I didn't have the proper guidance. OK, so I'm, I'm reflecting and thinking about this sitting in my cell. OK, so how do I get the system to see that? How do I get the system to see that I committed crimes without the knowledge of myself? Who is responsible for me not having the knowledge of myself. Sorry, but it wasn't my father, because he was without the knowledge of himself. Sorry, it wasn't my mother, because she was without the knowledge of herself. Because my father's name was Luther, my mother's name was Dorothy, and those names are names of the slave master. They were given a religion. Nothing against anybody's religion here. Religion is a way of life. Let's start there. Religion is a way of life, right? What is the true religion? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that the true religion is to do unto others as you would want done unto yourself. Now let's talk about, okay, you say you're a Muslim. Yes, I am. What's the basis of Islam? The basis of Islam teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is to serve Allah God and shun the devil. Now, that has to be understood because who is God and who is the devil? All of this have a very serious impact on the knowledge of self. My Asian brothers and sisters, my Latino brothers and sisters, all of my brothers and sisters who are non-white, we are victims of the lack of knowledge of self and the lack of love of self because the enemy could not control us if we had the knowledge of self and the love of self, because that would then breed unity among ourselves and we would become a power that they could not handle politically, economically, socially, educationally. We would be moving in the spirit of the creator of the heavens and the earth, not the Congress, not the Senate, or any other of these entities. I don't mean to shout, <laughs> but I am a different kind of speaker. OK. What are the issues you've seen with gun violence, despair among youth, and racial intentions in the city? I mentioned knowledge of self, the lack of knowledge of self, the lack of love of self, right? You know, while I was sitting in my cell thinking over these things that I did to myself, nobody did this to me, I did it to myself. It was peer pressure, yeah, it was foolishness. It was insanity, right? However, I knew that my life could change. But I had to find the right avenue. So I always heard about the nation of Islam. I always heard about the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And you know, that's another panel. 
right? Because I'm, I'm like Sister, Sister Catherine. I just want to go and keep on going with what I want to share to you, with you, okay? Because I am one of those youth that's in the street right now. But I'm a changed man today at 64 years old when I went to prison 19 years old a month before my 20th birthday. So as I was thinking about what I did to my life and I found that avenue that, I could, that could get me out of this, I said, okay, I need to uh, find the path to Islam. My thoughts generated a spirit in that prison. By the way, I was at Holmesburg Prison when all this took place. And I went out of my cell to go to child. That's when you go eat. And as I was going out, a brother came by. And he's still in prison today. He's a lifer. He's a former follower of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he seen me and he pulled me to the side and he said, young brother, I got a book for you to, to read. And I said, yes, sir. He said, yeah, after child, I'm going to come on your block with the book, cell block. That's what that means. Right? So he did that. He came and the book was message to the black man in America. I took that, which is a book written by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, one of his books, okay? And when I read that book, after I finished it, my mind was made up. And I decided that I would become a follower of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad under the leadership of the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan because what I read there is what I needed to know before what happened to me to cause me to be here in the first place. All right, so now let me go back where I was going with this. So, my aging brothers and sisters, particularly the youth I'm speaking to right now, we are given a lesson, and that lesson that we are given is called the student enrollment. And the first question of that lesson is, who is the original man? The answer to that question is, the original man is the Asiatic black man. Did y'all hear that? The original man is the Asiatic black man. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us Asia means the world. East Asia, West Asia, North Asia, South Asia. And the people in Asia is called Asiatic. Asiatic means citizen of the world, world citizen. So what am I saying here? We are the originators of the heavens and the earth because we are the direct descendants of the creator of the heavens and the earth. All human beings start with us. When we learn that and internalize that and actually relate to who we are, knowledge of self, it start the processing of changing our mind and our view of what we were told we are that was forced upon us by the former slave master and the former slave master's children and we are still under that to this very day. So with the lack of knowledge of self, the lack of love of self, it's easy for you or I to go out, pull a gun, shoot one, an one another, get a knife, stab one another, because we do not have the knowledge of self or the love of self, and if we did, we would never pull a gun or pull a knife on ourselves. We are bone of each other's bone, 
blood of each other's blood, skin of each other's skin. Okay, as far as the racial, um, excuse me, the cultural boundaries, very short, this, this is very short. We just need to establish our own cultural refinement centers. We just need to establish our own cultural refinement centers. I didn't say schools because we're dealing with our culture and we're uniting these cultures. We are teaching each other what the enemy white man has not taught us purposely so that he can do what? Control us. So that he can do what? Keep us enslaved. So he can do what? Keep the blind blind, the deaf deaf, and the dumb dumb. If that's the kind of leadership you want, then you will go down in hell with them. Y'all with me? Everybody all right? I'm not in trouble, am I? Police ain't coming, is they? So you are sharing words that I'm sharing with you that comes from a great teacher and a great leader. This is nothing of my own. I could not speak like this if it wasn't for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Why do you hate that man? That man saved my life. That man saved my life. You look at us youth in the street and you raise an ugly face at them. But listen, there's a man that loves us all. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Somebody said I was a representative here. No. No, I'm not. I am a student of this great teacher and this great leader of today, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I owe him everything for what he done for me. And I'm asking you, show your love to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You want to know what the solutions are? Go on NOI.org. Every question on this paper is already answered. Somebody said earlier in the, in, in, in the uh, event, excuse me, earlier today, I think it was Brother Brandon said to y'all, and I'm going to say it again. Oh, this is Minister Farrakhan, by the way. If you didn't know what he looked like, this is him. This is the advertisement for his just delivered Savings Day lecture in Chicago, uh, February 27th, Swan Song. Okay? Now, let's, let's go with Brother Brandon shared with us earlier today. He went to the Muslim program, and he spoke uh, on what the Muslims believe. And he shared with us number 10. We believe that we who declare ourselves to be righteous Muslims should not participate in wars which take the lives of humans. We do not believe this nation should force us to take part in wars for we have nothing to gain from it unless America agrees to give us the necessary territory wherein we may have something to fight for. So why you think that you are out here right now because we have failed in our duty? We don't give them nothing to stand tall for, nothing to stand strong for, nothing to stand as a civilized man and woman in a society that hates them. And y'all all right? <laughs> 
We have the solutions. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, I have presented you a program. You have not presented anything to even equal it to this day. He said that back in the 1940s and 50s when this program, the Muslim program, was presented. Do y'all hear me? We love all of our nationalists and pan-Africanists and all of the organizations that are on the front line out here fighting for justice. But y'all got to know who started this in America. You didn't even call yourself black until Elijah Muhammad told you you were black. You were calling yourself Negro, colored. Is that right? So we should examine that program as part of the developing of the solutions to the violence in the city of Philadelphia and across America. And you must listen to the swine song because Minister Farrakhan told us February 27th, your time is up. He said your time is up. He wasn't just talking about white folks, by the way. He's talking about all of us. He said that the swine song is not for me. The swan song is for you. You thought I was coming to sing to you today? Sing a song of goodbye? No, I come to introduce to you your swan song. And part of your swan song is the problem of violence. The part of your swan song is that you have failed off of the foundation that can fix this overnight. It's not politics. It's the spiritual foundation of God himself. You can continue to run after the rabbit's tail but all that's going to lead you to is hell. Listen to this, and I'm going to conclude, Brother Jeremiah. <laughs> Be yourself. Be your beautiful self. Be your adorable self. Be your personal self. Don't try to be no one else. Don't try to be anyone else. You don't need to be white to make it. Yeah, well, you know, some of us passed for white. And back in the, in the day, uh, Dr. Monterio, um, you know, that person might be able to uh, help us get a job. We should be doing what? Creating a job. And I bear witness that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has delivered everything that he has told us that we should be doing. You'll say, okay, well, where's all that at now, right, right now? Well, in 1975, something happened. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad left us, and the government and, and other uh, nations destroyed the nation of Islam. Are y'all familiar with that? So now the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan stood up in 1977 and he said to the government, he said to those nations, he said to the FBI, he said to the CIA that he was rebuilding the nation of Islam and that if they got in his way, that Allah God himself will deal with them. That was 1977. We're in 20. 22, and the nation is back to its former glory. And I um, um, uh, felt so uh, good and real, like, I, I can't even describe it. My wife, too, when Brother Brandon and his wife said, we're going to save his day. I was blown away. 
We were in Savings Day in Chicago together. And our national prison minister, Abdullah Muhammad, he said to me, before we went, they didn't know. He said, Brother Gregory, this is so beautiful and so powerful. The world needs to know about this visit. We got Chinese, we got Japanese in the Nation of Islam. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So anytime that you come home, that is beautiful and powerful every time. This is your home. You don't have to worry about calling yourself no American. American is for European or Caucasian. Caucasian means ones whose evil is not, con is not confined to himself but affect others. You don't want that. <laughs> so I thank Almighty God Allah for blessing me to listen to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan through the books and the tapes and the videos. And I can't overlook a brother that just walked in here that bear witness to my beginning, our brother Jerron Muhammad. He gave me my first tape. He brought him into prison. Okay, so I think I covered everything because I'm a different kind of speaker. So I think I covered all of the questions. All right, so I thank you for tolerating me. I love you and may Allah bless you with all that is good. I greet you again. With the greeting words of peace, assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for our three speakers. <laughs> Now we're going to go to a brief section of Q&A. Um, how are we on time? 15? OK. I think, well, since we're all speaking, I think we should be OK. It should be OK, since we're all, we're all going to be speaking. So. Um, Well, I wanted to start off with, um, I guess, just reflecting on each of your presentations, um, which are all very different, but I enjoyed it because they were so different. Um, and I think as each of you were speaking, First of all, I was reminded of, you know, Pastor Lee when you talked about how do we even think about violence, what do we define as violence. Um, it also made me think of, of Dr. King when he said, positive peace is not the absence of tension but the presence of justice. And I think across the board, I think another, another aspect of this is the question of values, of moral values, and also the framework by which you understand the world so that you can actually be part of changing it and become a force for good. Um, and I think in that whole equation, the question, I think the question still, I think from my mind is important of education or I guess more specifically how how people gain the values that they do, um, that process. And, and Brother Gregory talked about this, but I think I was just curious 
for all of you. Um, you know, how in your life experience, how did you develop that sense of responsibility, but also this broader framework for understanding the world and the kinds of values that were needed in order to be, in order to not just live with the status quo, but to actually become a force for trying to change things and trying to, you know, take responsibility for your life, but also for the people. Because um, I think, yeah, Brother Gregory talked about a little bit about himself, but um, we haven't heard as much from, I think, both Catherine and Pastor Lee about their life stories, which I think all three of you are very remarkable people um, and have a lot to teach the younger generation, both in terms of your words, but also the lives that you've lived. Um, and so I just wanted to ask again, like, what was that, what was so pivotal for you in terms of being able to develop that consciousness and that inner drive to, you know, actually take responsibility? Um, so yeah, if any of you want to answer that. Okay. Um, I think for me, uh, it was the kind of uh, awareness of the other who's different from me. And it's not the issue of right or wrong, but just different, right? And uh, that happened, uh, you know, multiple times in my life. And e each time uh, I was able to um, kind of uh, broaden my world and uh, kind of a see myself being part of that world. So one good example, um, I think in 93 or 94, don't quote me on this, uh, I wasn't still in Korea, and wa I watched a movie uh, called Philadelphia. So I believe it was the, the first major Hollywood production about you know, issue of gay uh, rights. And back then in Korea, gay right was not even an issue. I mean, there were uh, you know, LGBTQ uh, community in, in Korea, but it was not even a social issue. So it, it, it was a kind of eye-opening. And uh, back a little bit, you know, I don't know, I heard earlier um, Do Hyun shared about Korean War. So after Korean War, growing up in Korea, like, in especially elementary school, whenever uh, we talk about communists in North Korea, they were uh, red colored and looked like a monster. But uh, in the uh, 70s, we had a kind of a political exchange and some higher uh, officials came to Korea. It was broadcast in TV and I was shocked. They looked like us, their skin color was not red they spoke same language. So it kind of a same kind of shock in a good way, you know, because I grew up in a very conservative Christian church. So obviously if you're gay, you're gonna go to hell, you're a sinner. But you know, in, in movie Philadelphia, the one uh, Tom Hanks uh, acted out was a decent human being. And kind of a, the experience of seeing the other and recognizing that the other, regardless of the categorization, I think that that needs to happen. And in, in this age and time, when schools are more segregated, like urban schools are, like, like Dockery High School is 90% African American. It was suburban neighborhood, it's all white and some Asian. How can you see somebody else and see that he may eat different food, but he or she is also a decent human being. So that experience that I had was one of the biggest influence of making who I am and the way I see the world. So, so at any rate, uh, I've been impacted by the fact that I am a parent uh, a teacher, I am a great grandmom, <laughs> and, and uh, thank you. Uh, and um, 
but I also have been engaged in supporting liberation struggles going back to a date I will not mention. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, and even uh, during the time of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and uh, of course, uh, Minister Farrakhan. All right, I mean, that played a role in Philadelphia real big. So I think that when you teach, which is a mission and a pap per, uh, mission of purpose and a passion, you learn to love the children. You cannot teach them if you do not love them. All right, and um, through loving them, you extend yourself because you want to give them the best of you in order for them to be the best of themselves. But not only that, you will fight for them. I know that my students know, are new. If somebody bothered them, as Tony would tell you, <laughs> they would have to fight with the staff because we would fight for them. There, nobody could bother our students, but in turn, our students had to be righteous, all right? So we instilled with them the values that we learn through our life experiences, our church experiences, our experiences with the mosque, uh, and it was international. It was not just limited uh, just to one race, or one class, it was international. And that came from my experience with dealing with liberation struggles and even the freedom struggle at home and listening to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King because that, that single garment of destiny is real. It is very, very real. And so that's why I mentioned those two schools. In these schools in Philadelphia, I had the data, but I couldn't give you all that I have. But I have the data, and um, many of these schools have significant populations of Asian children and black children and Latinx children. All Now, they may not have that many white children, but they have everybody else. So we can make things happen in these schools, but we have to take control of them. But I thought that the two schools, Bach, not Bach, I'm sorry, the two schools, Southern, rather, and, of course, for Ness, are ideal because socioeconomically, they are the same almost, sharing the same communities, experiencing many of the same problems. And if we could talk to those principles, maybe we could get something done. And I know one and could talk to the other one, but it's time that we start uh, engineering change by going to our young people and helping them see that there is another path and that there is hope and violence is not the answer. Well, I guess partially I was asking um, in response to your, your remarks, which were explaining the process by which you were transformed by the teachings of the Honorable Minister um, Elijah Muhammad, is that correct? And the Honor Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, and, and so I think I just wanted to, you know, raise this question of, because young people don't, so many young people don't really have those kinds of teachers in their lives. And they don't have to be actual you know, school teachers, but they can be school teachers, they can be in churches, they can be in mosques. And, um, and I think I wanted to raise this question of you know, how did you as an individual like, go through that process of being transformed by those teachings? Um, and how did that cultivate in you like, as you said, a knowledge of self, but also a knowledge of, you know, the world that you live in and how you want to be part of changing that world and bettering it um, because we all share, you know, this common, this common destiny. Okay, thank you. Wow, that was a lot. Um, 
Um, if I could, <clears throat> when the changes started taking place in my life in prison, I began to view people, of course, differently. And I'm talking about all people. I even had some whites that I sat at the table. What do I mean by table? I'm sorry. Well, in prison, the prison I was in, they have what is called a day room. All right? And the inmates come out, tables set up like, like you have here a little bit. And, you know, you have card games going on, chess games going on. This is going on over here, just lollygagging over there. And at my table, my table was called self-improvement because of the self-improvement program established by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that um, came out of a lecture that he gave in Phoenix, Arizona back in 1986 called Self-Improvement, Basis for Community Development. And from that, study guides were developed for us to study the man, the man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, okay, that would improve your life, black, brown, yellow, red, and white. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad would in his letters as we are uh, taught from Minister Farrakhan as he shared with us, messenger of Allah to you all. He got a message for the black man and a message for the white man, okay? So I, I, I started there because I was be out on the table my, by myself. I had my books there. And one day, a little brother, his name was Sam. He's a juvenile in an adult prison. He was from Cambodia. And Sam walked by my table a couple times, just looking. So I think the third time, I said, come on, brother, you want to see what I got over here? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he came over, he sat down, and I started sharing what I learned that changed my life. And I told him about himself that I said earlier, who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, God of the universe. Little Sam wasn't little no more. Little Sam grew. He jumped up. What? I never heard that before. I said, well, you can learn more. He said, I was going to Juma. Well, you can still go over there and come over here and talk to me. So Sam never wrote his savers letter, but Sam was one of my brothers. The guards didn't like Sam because Sam was, did I say he was a juvenile? So Sam was in a lot of stuff too. And I showed him how to deal with what he was faced with in the cell block from the teachings that saved me. And when they seen, I believe, this is what I believe. I'm, I could be speculating, but this is what I believe. They transferred me out of the prison. That happened more than once. I even got called to the commanding officer's office, the captain, and he asked me, are you recruiting? You know there's no recruiting in here. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, the brother came and asked me about the Final Call newspaper. And I told him to come on and sit down and read it with me. The guard was watching us. Next thing I know, he called me to the desk and said, I need to go up to security to see you. Is that recruiting? 
That's what happened? I said, yes, sir, that's what happened. He said, well, look, Mr. Moore, that's my slave name. My, my name is Gregory Muhammad. <laughs> anyway, don't be recruiting in the block. I said, I'm sharing my life with my brothers in this block, especially the younger ones, because I don't want them to go home, commit another crime, and come back. He looked at me and said, all right, Mr. Moore, we're watching you. Go ahead on back to your block. Nothing happens to you. You're OK, right? Now, that was in 2002 when that happened. Let me share this with you. In 1983, I received a personal letter from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It was in response to me feeling a little down with my uh, development, my, my resurrection, because of what I was in prison for. And I had a problem with being forgiven. This the white man's mind I'm talking here. Brother said, Brother Reverend Lee said, you're never forgiven once you go into the system. That's the truth. A Christian nation, that's an unforgiving nation. Guess what? I'm on parole right now, yeah for another 17 years, right? Even though I changed my life, I'm bringing it up for a reason. But where am I at? I am at the Asian Arts Initiative sharing with you Korea, Vietnam, and Afro-America, our shared struggle for peace and democracy. And I don't care what they think about me being here. If there's, if they, if, if they, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share something with you. Because when they see you successful and they don't have nothing to do with it, now it's a problem with your parole. You heard about that, Reverend Lee? Now it's a problem with your parole. You're hanging out with these revolutionaries. You're hanging out with these anti-Americans. You're hanging out. You know you're not supposed to be there, but guess what? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad was taken off the street back in the 1940s when the war ignited for teaching against the war. He wasn't no criminal. So that empowers me now. So if they take me back, I'm happy. Yes, I'm, 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 listen to me now. No, I'm not crazy. See, because this is all I know, Brother Jeremiah. This is all I know now. Okay, this, this is what saved my life. So this is what I share with all the youth that I come in contact with. All right? I'm not, I'm not paid by the government. I don't get no grants. I don't, I, I, they won't give me a loan anyway. <laughs> All right, so nobody, there's no strings on me and no hand going my back. I love the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. That's what saved my life. Do we have time for one question? Sure. Well, I think we have time for one question, if you'd like to ask. Uh, there's a microphone here. Uh, oh, can we do this? You know, I'm tall now. Okay, how y'all doing? All right, good afternoon everyone and assalamu alaikum. My name is Asantwa Nkrumah Ture. I'm an organizer with Black Alliance for Peace here in Philadelphia. 
I want to give greetings to all the panelists and especially to the members of the Nation of Islam. I go way, way back to 1975 with you all, with uh, my big brother Kwame Ture, formerly known by the slave name of Stokely Carmichael. So we go way, way back. But anywho, uh, first I want to thank the organizers for this event. Uh, this is a great event and we need to have more of these in the future. We need to build greater solidarity among all of us. And I do mean all of us, but especially our Asian family and our African family and everybody else who wants to be family. Because this is how we build movements, by coming together. Uh, I want to also say that I'm especially proud to meet more and more Chinese youth who are not anti-Chairman Mao. I'm especially very proud to meet more Vietnamese youth who are not anti-Ho Chi Minh. Because for black revolutionaries, we remember Ho Chi Minh in Harlem listening to the Honorable Marcus Garvey, all right? But um, my brother from the Nation of Islam, you, you took part of my question. Um, is there any place online in your archives where we can see the newsletter where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spoke out against World War II, against the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima? I saw the picture of the newsletter before Muhammad Speaks. I saw that picture in the 1980s. But I'm wondering now, we have a lot of students here in this audience. Where can we find that picture of Honorable Elijah Muhammad speaking out against the US bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima? People need to see that picture. I haven't found it myself, but maybe you all have it in your archives. And thank you very much. Thank you for that question. And uh, I'm glad Brother Jerron is here. <laughs> yes, he's, he's uh, very close with the final call. He writes for the final call. So I want to know if Brother Jerron can answer your question. You know, Muhammad Speaks didn't come out to 1961. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was jailed in 1942. He was too old for the draft, but they wanted him off the street because he was speaking peace when they were calling for war. Um, I have never read where he spoke about the bombing. I know Brandon has done some uh, independent research of, of Muhammad speaks of, of late. So, uh, I know it's before Muhammad Speaks, but Muhammad Speaks did publish, you know, like publish Lumumba's uh, death, which took place in 1960. It published it in 1964. So there are a lot of things that took place prior to Muhammad Speaks in 61, but was published later in Muhammad Speaks. Uh, so th there could be statements or history because it reviewed books there's a lot of information that was happening historically that didn't get, uh, that of course predated Muhammad Speaks but got published later on. So I don't know if Brandon, from your recent research, if you've seen that. Okay, so no, I haven't. And it could, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, you know. But also the, the, the nation, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a column in various black papers around the country uh, uh, in the 50s, so that could have happened in the Pittsburgh Courier, could have happened in the Amsterdam News, could have happened in the Los Angeles Sentinel. So he did uh, publish his columns, so if you look back at those columns, so maybe, I'm not sure. Thank you, Brother Jerome. Is it a question or a comment? Okay, okay, I think we, after this we have to move on to the next panel. He talked about the slave master, but I think that the colonizer should also be included in your conversation unless you consider colonization the same as slavery. So I just wanted to see if, if the other, if you yourself and the other commentators have anything to say about colonization. Watch your mic, watch the mic. Uh, thank you, sister. No, uh, yes, you, you, you right on it. Um, the slave master is the colonizer. What else could he be? So um, 
he dominates where he invades. And he sets up his government. Or he used you or them as a puppet. So yes, the slave master is also the colonizer. Okay, thank you, Brother Gregory, Pastor Lee, and Catherine. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer more questions, but um, we're on a pretty tight schedule today. So now I think we're gonna move on to the next panel, which is about how immigrants can stand up to the war agenda. And just another round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.